Dr. Patrick Walsh, welcome to International Eurasia Press Fund. Thank you very much. I'm honoured to be here. My pleasure. Yes, we've learned a lot of things about you and we know that Azerbaijan people have much love to you and uh, you are almost a famous person in Azerbaijan. And you're also a researcher and historian and you've written many historical books. So today we have some questions about the history, especially we are meeting here after the war, after the Second Kerbal War, after the liberation of the lands. So as a research and historian of the Caucasus region, uh, what can you say about the historical background uh, of Azerbaijani territories, and including present territory of Armenia, where Azerbaijani nationals used to live 100 years ago, and also its subsequent distribution? Well, I mean, obviously, in the West, we're all quite familiar with the Armenian narrative. Uh, the Armenian narrative is, of course, uh, a sort of grandiose uh, viewpoint that Armenia was a gigantic state uh, which uh, you know has existed for almost eternity and has a right to a you know a vast amount of territory um, of course this isn't true I mean, if you do research you you, you can realize that uh, a lot of these uh, uh, issues that are prevent, presented as facts are actually a mythology really um, so, yes, what, what we know about really is that um, uh, Karabakh itself, uh, I think, has been a, a sort of mixed region for a long period of time. The Armenians completely uh, deny this, of course. Um, they see it as a purely Armenian uh, territory, uh, which, of course, it isn't. Um, and we all know the, the, the history of, of places like Shusha uh, and uh, the independent Khanates uh, that existed long, long before... Um, uh, the Armenians would, would admit. We also know that um, Erevan uh, was essentially originally a, a Muslim Azerbaijani uh, area. Uh, in, in fact, when Armenia was established as a state in 1918, the, I think the population balance was only slightly in, uh, in favor of the Armenians, and this has been the result of Russian colonization, where they moved Armenians from Iran and from uh, Eastern Turkey into this area to create a sort of buffer, uh, a buffer zone. So it was essentially a colonial project, a plantation. So uh, the Armenian numbers in this region are of quite recent, uh, of quite recent development, uh, and not what the Armenians pretend. Um, so uh, you know the Armenian narrative is is false, uh, uh, although it's presented as factual in the West, which is very unfortunate. And um, you know, uh, whenever you read Western reports, you always see the uh, you know the mainly Armenian area of, of Nagorno-Karabakh or things like this. You see, mm -hmm. but of course this isn't true, and it has to be qualified with the history, you know, of colonization, of plantation, of population movement, of Russian uh, occupation for uh, uh, the century before, from the 1830s. Uh, and, um, and you have to look at the changing population shifts that also occurred during the, the time of the First World War and just afterwards when a lot of um, uh, Azerbaijani Muslims, Kurds, etc. were intimidated out of these areas and they became uh, you know, majority Armenian areas because of the fact that there was uh, extensive uh, ethnic cleansing. And even during the Soviet times, of obviously Stalin, when he established uh, the borders of uh, of the of the region, also had a um, uh, a program in mind, uh, you know, to separate, for instance, Nakhchivan and Karabakh, so that um, you know uh, there was no uh, contact. Uh, he obviously was uh, uh, determined to uh, not to have a, a connection between the uh, the Turk the uh, elements of the Turkic yes. world. So you know th this is why you know this area, for instance. Um, Western Zangazor mm -hmm. is uh, currently part of Armenia. Uh, uh, so, so look, this none of these things are known very widely. By the way, West. we will have also a question about the Western Zangazor, as you yeah. mentioned there. Okay. Uh, and particularly, your area of knowledge is based on the First World War, which yeah. happened since that time. So, after the First World War, as I said, one of the important political developments in the South Caucasus uh, was Zangazor issue. Yes. So. Uh, what's the importance of Zangazor issue in terms of the separation from Azerbaijan 
and annexation to Armenia mm. at that time. And what was the policy of the UK and US towards Zengazur at that time? Mm. Probably UK was one of the active mm, European side that has a connection, as a link with yeah. this. Well, I think, you know, during the British occupation from, you know, the end of 1918, um, you know, the, the British uh, um, administration uh, was tended to treat Karabakh and Zangazor as part of Azerbaijan. And in fact, on maps, it's, it's marked uh, like this. Uh, I did some research on some of the old maps of around this period of time, and it's clearly that these areas are regarded as part of mm -hmm. Azerbaijan. Um, the Armenians obviously wanted these areas and, and their, their, their objective was to try to take them in Versailles uh, at the Versailles Peace Conference. They wanted the map redrawn. This was one of the problems really and this created great instability within uh, the, the region around about 1919 because of the fact that there was always a question mark. Uh, the Armenians obviously wanted a sort of payback for their services during the war in um, uh, helping to destroy the Ottoman Empire. I mean, that's what they tried to do, and they were in the British House of Commons, they were, you know, praised and lauded for this. And um, so essentially they wanted these territories, and they, they thought they would get a great Armenian state, Magna Armenia. So there was always a question mark on those. Uh, but the British uh, seemed to regard as Angazor and Karabakh as a bit part of Azerbaijan, even at this point in time. Uh, uh, so uh, the United States, well, I mean, President Woodrow Wilson was uh, quite a pro-Armenian uh, president, um, so he had, uh, you know, he obviously was quite biased and uh, wanted to uh, wanted to sort of like, you know, create a large as a large as Armenia as possible. Obviously, he was frustrated in the end uh, because uh, Congress, the U.S. Senate, which has powers of treaty making, um, frustrated him. Actually, Irish American senators particularly frustrated him. Uh, uh, by by preventing him, uh, uh, you know, signing up to Versailles or or even uh, the army, uh, his uh, Wilson's uh, Armenia. I think in terms of uh, so the other powers. Um, well, I mean, in fact, we we have to say this that I've looked at the British archives as well, and I've read uh, you know the uh, the, um, the discussions that went uh, on behind the scenes. Uh, uh, Arnold Toynbee, for instance, who was uh, a very famous historian at the time, and uh, had, had lent his hand to writing anti-Turk propaganda as part of mm -hmm. Wellington House, the secret propaganda organization that was set up uh, during the war uh, in, in Whitehall. Um, he, he, he was determined as well. He, wanted, he was urging on the British government to try to separate Turkey from Azerbaijan uh, because they, uh, a lot of the viewpoints, in the, even in the British Foreign Office, was that uh, there was this uh, pan turanian sort of empire that was going to materialize. And of course, because Turkey was in alliance, or the Ottoman Empire was in alliance with Germany, mm -hmm. they saw this as an extension of the German influence right across uh, to the east. So they, were, they had similar intentions to try to detach uh, Azerbaijan, the south, Caucasus from Turkey as well. And this was what the purpose of Armenia was geopolitically. It was going to be a buffer uh, between Turkey and the rest of the Turkic world to the east. So a lot of the great powers then, unfortunately, I'm obviously we've already talked about Russia, um, which also wanted this type of uh, uh, bulwark uh, there. Uh, obviously the Russian state collapsed, the Tsar state collapsed, so they couldn't do this. But, but then Stalin and the Bolsheviks uh, took up the same geopolitical um, interest of separating uh, these areas. So this is where Western Zangazor comes in. Mm -hmm. and really nearly all the great powers are interested in separating the two parts of the Turkic world. And uh, um, there is a, a subsequent story that's very interesting because when I was writing my book a few years back, I, I mean, I wasn't fully aware about the debates that occurred in the, the British cabinet. Winston Churchill was very much uh, opposed to Lloyd George, who was the Prime Minister at this time. Mm -hmm. Lloyd George wanted to use the Greeks and the Armenians to basically carve up uh, Turkey and, 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 and basically make it as small as possible. Mm -hmm. And Churchill said to, to Lloyd George, and uh, he said, look, the real danger in the world is Bolshevism. And what we need is a peace treaty with the Turks, very quickly, a generous peace treaty, in which there we will um, employ their services in the Caucasus. Because if we have this, 
we can fight off the Bolsheviks and keep uh, you know, Baku's oil away from Moscow. Uh, Lloyd George didn't listen to him. I mean, Lloyd George was determined. He was a very uh, pro-Greek, uh, pro-Armenian. Pro he was from that liberal uh, background, Gladstonian liberal background. And he decided to, to impose this punitive treaty, the Treaty of Severus, on Turkey. And this, of course, proved a disaster. Yeah. And subsequently, the, 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 the sort of problem for Azerbaijan with this was that Kemal Ataturk, his only option was to basically to form an alliance at, uh, of convenience with the Bolsheviks uh, to fight Britain. Because he had, Turkey would not have survived if he hadn't have done this. He had to secure his uh, eastern flank. So essentially this, of course, left Azerbaijan in the Soviet sphere and it left the Bolsheviks being able to carve up the, the uh, territorial settlement here. And that's really, I think, the background of the story. So far we spoke a lot about the war, mm. but, you know, uh, sometimes the war doesn't really have an exceptional role in solution or achieving something mm. which you want. Uh, right now, currently, uh, after, especially after the Second Karabakh War. So, what steps should Azerbaijan and Armenia have to take in future relations mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, regional cooperation as well as ensure international relations, etc.? So, in this term, what these two countries have to do? Mm. Well, you know, warfare is always a prelude to peace. I mean, essentially, uh, in some ways, it's to establish peace uh, and, it's, and it's also its purpose is to try and in any settlement to have an enduring peace because to make further warfare unnecessary. So that always has to be understood. Some people don't understand this. They, they like the idea of almost permanent warfare. Unfortunately, this is very characteristic of Armenian nationalism. But um, so what should people do? Well, I think, you know, from the, I think Azerbaijan's position is, is very sensible. It's based on international law, the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Um, it's basically, its position is that uh, the Soviet maps w would be used um, uh, you know, to delineate border areas, and I think this is the sensible solution. Um, from Armenians, Ar Armenia's point of view, I mean, I've looked at Armenian politics over the last year or so, in fact, longer than that, but, um, you know, it's uh, obviously in Armenia, it's a difficult situation for Pashinyan, Nikol Pashinyan. He has... The reality has dawned in Armenia that there has to be peace and stability, there has to be economic revival. If, if there isn't, um, the Armenian state is, itself is, uh, is under question. It's, it's become almost a province of Russia. Uh, it needs to be able to break out of this, uh, this uh, uh, hegemony, uh, both to achieve you know, real independence, which is what it sort of set out to do in 1991, but also to achieve economic viability, to, to make uh, an Armenia where more people can uh, live and have a, an existence and have a better standard of life. Now, all, only, this can only really be achieved through one, a, a peace settlement that's functional, um, a, a, a moving away from aggressive nationalism where you desire more territory, but you cannot actually sustain or develop this territory because you don't have the human or physical resources to do so. And we saw this in Karabakh where um, the Armenians did absolutely nothing but destroy the place over a period of two decades. So it, Armenia needs to concentrate on its, the land it actually holds at the present minute, the Armenian state, and develop that for its people. And Azerbaijan obviously is interested in uh, producing infrastructural development. Uh, and, and of course, this also uh, is related to Armenia's uh, relations with Turkey, which of course are very difficult. Um, obviously, we have this issue of to do with the uh, so-called Armenian genocide, uh, which has been a poison. But you know, Turkey's uh, you know sort of willing to live with this to a sense, in a sense, if if uh, in the sense that it will not accept this. Of course, it's not a historical fact. Uh, but it, what it's willing to do is to have good relations with Armenia, and I think you know this is the key to Armenia's future because you know obviously. Armenia needs to go westward, you know, it needs to develop into Europe and, and it can only do this through, to, through its main trade, uh, trading uh, potential westward through Turkey and, and, and areas like this. But unfortunately today, currently the Armenians who are living in the western world yeah. still have the ideas of aggression and separatism. Yeah, yeah. And this means that the western world doesn't really make a big role in the change of the national interests. Yeah. 
and they're still claiming and they're just voicing from the western side against mm. Azerbaijan and still claiming that the Karabakh belongs to them or whatever yeah. the, the stories they're trying to invent. Uh, I mean, how it's possible to take these kind of ideas out of the brain of people? Yeah. Does it need some time? Or what, how much time does it need? In, yeah, you, it's an important aspect. It's the diaspora is, a, in a sense, is a, a sort of poisonous element for Armenia, and you know I, I'm well acquainted with their literature and their uh, what they produce. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Armenian diaspora has a very sort of romanticized version of Armenian history. They don't actually live in Armenia, so they tend to see Armenia from a Californian point of view. I mean, the Irish diaspora in uh, in, in uh, the United States is similar in relation to Ireland. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's, it's, it's not the same as the, the Armenian diaspora. The problem, I think, is, yes, you're exactly right. It lives in this type of, um, you know, this heroic struggle of these dashnaks of the past. And it the wants, stereotypes yeah, are still leaving in the exactly. mind of people. And, it, it, of course, its identity is so tied up with this uh, campaign to recognize Armenian genocide. I mean, I think, you know, Armenia's, Armenia's culture, its rich history has really suffered from this single-minded, myopic concentration of anti-Turkism, which is just destructive of people's, um, of general character. You know, I, I think of my, my own country, Ireland and Britain, you know, we've, had, we've made peace, you know, we've had peace treaties, we live together, we, we have no problem, to, we, we obviously have issues about history, but you know, we have to get on with things and you know but unfortunately this type of concentration on uh, recognizing the Armenian genocide so called and also you know territorial um, uh, you know getting money stuff like this and an and, and endless sort of like uh, um, you know celebrations or commemorations or stuff like this you know it's just um, it's not good positive things for the for Armenia for its people who have to live in the real world of today and have to have a better standard of living and stay in their state and appreciate what territory they actually hold and be able to develop this in a functional way. They've seen Azerbaijan, they've seen what's happened in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan in the first Karabakh war was a, was a dysfunctional state. It found it very difficult leaving the Soviet Union and not knowing what to do. It had lots of changes of government. It had like, you know, a lot of dysfunction really. But over the last two decades, you know, since Haider Aliyev took charge and then his son um, Ilham, you know, they've seen what, what the difference has been. You know, that Azerbaijan concentrated on it, its efforts on, on its national territory and developing its national territory for its own people. And this must surely have had an effect on the Armenians. I've, I've seen Armenians commenting this actually uh, on the end of the diaspora. So maybe the war is a good thing for them. It's, it's a wake up call. It's like Giving a shock, a, a bit, shock to the system. To wake up from the dreams. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. No, it's not going to wake everybody up. Yeah. You know. By the way, uh, so during the Second Karabakh War, uh, you were one of the persons who supported the rights of Azerbaijan. Yeah. And we follow your status and you shared on your social net, net on the social network, and you were on the side of Azerbaijan when it was fighting for its integrity. Yeah. So, what makes you love Azerbaijan so much? Um, very sincere question. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's and a also difficult very question. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You are from Ireland, yeah. and it's too far from Azerbaijan. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you just fall in love with Azerbaijan, yeah, a yeah. country like this. That's true. So, well, I suppose you know it's a difficult one that to answer. It's not curiosity, no, way, sorry, no, but no, it's no, just no. an interest that to yeah. get to know that you, yeah. you share your love, maybe your impressions of what makes you to do this. Well, I do. T I mean, first of all, I do tend to think politically and historically in the sense that you know before I talk about the other aspects. But you know, I, you know, I, firstly, you know, international law is one hundred percent behind Azerbaijan, right? M morally, you know, it's it, it also in moral terms, Azerbaijan has a complete. Uh, uh, ascendancy uh, in this situation and you know I've, I've never been a person that supports like aggressive nationalism and uh, I, I've always been a sort of more moderate sort of person who wants uh, development and, and people to live uh, you know together uh, re reconciliation and things like that. We, we, we've suffered too much of this in our own country in Ireland uh, so you know I've, I've definitely seen 
uh, you know, it's a bit like deja vu. You know, these uh, these ethnic quarrels, these ethnic conflicts are they need to be settled. You know, so I come from, it from that point of view, and the only way I can see a functional settlement is what is what has actually happened. Unfortunately, the international community, international diplomacy, was you know proved incapable of coming to a uh, like a, to, to to solve this problem. So it had to be solved by armed force. There was no, there was nothing. Uh, you know, there, there was nothing could be done. Uh, but um, yeah, well, how do, why do I love? I mean, I visited Baku, I think, 2018 for the first time. Um, you know, there's, oh, there's a lot about the city that I, I really love. I, I have an interest in, uh, in, in, in a lot of it, uh, uh, the Turkic world. I have an interest in the Russian world. I've always been a, a follower of Russian politics and, uh, and culture. And um, also, uh, the, these things seem to meet in, in, in Azerbaijan. You know, these very things that, uh, that I have a great interest in. To me, uh, you know, Baku is a very European city, but at the same time, it has its own traditional culture. It has its past, uh, uh, Shivan Shahs, and, uh, and and all the uh, you know even the Soviet period, and you know the, the and, and the recent development. I love the architecture. I love the food. The people are very, very generous and very, very uh, friendly. Uh, uh, you know, I've I honestly. I've just loved my time so much here, and I try to come here as much as possible. Actually, it's my favourite destination of, of of anywhere. So, you know, I I suppose that's the answer. By the way, your homeland is Ireland. Yes. And in Northern Ireland. Yes. And you have fought for freedom in history. Yeah. yeah. And you are quite much common with Azerbaijan's history. Yeah. 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 And. When do you expect Paphos to leave Britain yeah. and reunite with the South? Yeah, yeah. And in general, to what extent does it does the Irish society willing this to happen? Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I understand. It's a difficult problem. This because um, obviously Ireland was partitioned around 1921 uh, when the the bulk of of Ireland, the island of Ireland, left uh, the the British state and established itself as a free state, and then ultimately as not the Irish Republic. And you know, Ireland's become a very successful state. Uh, in fact, I think it's often numbered in the top 10 most prosperous countries in the world these days. And as I say, we have no natural resources, but it's been done. This has been a great um, advertisement for independence. You know, our agricultural, our pharmaceutical, our IT industries are really top, top drawer. And um, the standard of living in Ireland is very, very high. Wages are very, very high. In fact, you know, it's more expensive to live in Dublin than it would be in, in London. So, you know, the Irish independent state's been immensely successful after 700 years of being told the Irish could not do nothing for themselves, you know, by, by, our, um, by, our, by our occupiers. Okay, a similar sort of relationship maybe Azerbaijan has with Russia, we have with, with Britain, Great Britain. But, um, so when, now the problem we have obviously is we have a divided community in, in one part of Ireland, in the north of Ireland where I live. Uh, perhaps about 50% of the people are, uh, see themselves as British, 50% see themselves as Irish. And this was the original sort of reason for partition. People have over-integrated already. Yeah, well, I mean, people do get, in, get on together well. I mean, there's no, there's no problems in that respect. And we had a 28-year conflict, obviously, but that, that was ended by the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And that was through, you know, the good... Uh, offices of uh, Tony Blair and uh, Bill Clinton, President Clinton, you know, and this has been a functional settlement and basically the way the settlement works is there will be a, a border poll at some point, uh, probably maybe next year where the, when the, um, the main uh, Republican Party in, in Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin, will probably take more, most seats in the Assembly. Uh, they are nearly there now. At that point, there may well be triggered a border poll, and essentially what happens there, if there's 51% of people in Northern Ireland vote for uh, reunification with the, with the Irish Republic, it will happen. That's the part of the terms of the treaty. So, uh, this speculation, when is this going to happen? Probably within a generation, I would say. I wouldn't say within 10 years, but within a generation, it will probably happen. The economy is working that way since Britain left the European Union. Uh, we've tended to we we've stayed within the single market, and um, so there's an economic border now in the Irish Sea. So everything is tending towards this, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, we have a lot of work to do. We have to you know make make peace settlement uh, with our our, our fellow uh, countrymen, our Protestant uh, British people who live in the north. You know we have to make Ireland uh, a good place for them. 
So we have to, you know, we don't want to uh, alienate them. We don't want another conflict, you know. So this is this is our difficult task now. Thank you very much for sharing no your problem. views, and thank you very much for visiting us. It's a pleasure. Appreciate. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.